On May 6, 2016, Deadline Hollywood broke the scoop that in addition to star as Batman, Ben Affleck has been given the role of executive producer on Justice League. In this video, I will give my take on what this might mean, why they haven't replaced Zack Snyder as Justice League director now that his true feelings towards Batman and Superman has gotten out, the director of The Flash Jumping Ship, and some more troubling news coming from Suicide Squad. First, let's clarify just what an executive producer is, because it can mean a lot of different things. On one extreme, you have the pure marquee titles, such as Stan Lee being listed as executive producer on a bunch of Marvel-based movies, despite having zero involvement or influence over them, beyond being invited to set to hang out or to participate in a cameo at most. More commonly, however, an executive producer is mostly involved with the business side of things. While he or she may be instrumental in securing finance and appointing the filmmakers, and give either thumbs up or thumbs down for important creative or financial decisions, they generally aren't that hands-on, and rarely present on set. In most cases, however, both producers and directors answer to the executive producer, who often has the final word. For instance, it would have been an executive producer who insisted Batman v Superman only be two and a half hours long in theaters. In this case, it is clearly not just a marquee title. Earlier, we've conclusively learned that Ben Affleck will both produce, write and direct the upcoming solo Batman movie, and now he will have a much bigger role in the filmmaking side of Justice League as well. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Affleck will fine-tune the script alongside Chris Terrio, as well as inform the post-production process. It would appear that while Zack Snyder remains the director, it is now Ben Affleck who ultimately calls the shots on Justice League. This comes as no surprise. His recent success and track record both behind and in front of the camera has made him Warner's golden boy, and someone they want to keep within their ranks and happy. And happy is one thing Affleck clearly was not at Batman v Superman's reception, not after he promised how much better it was going to be than Fox's Daredevil, which he also starred in only for Batman v Superman to receive an arguably greater backlash and worse critical reception than Daredevil ever got. Of course, there are more people at Warner not happy about how Batman v Superman was received, such as the head honchos that actually call the shots. Let's recap that for a moment. If the Warner higher-ups, as it was reported way back when, gave a standing applause to earlier cuts of the movie, that applause came to a sudden halt in February. That's when Drew McQueenie first reported that Warner had started showing the finished movie to test audiences, who did not respond to it like Warner imagined they would. Warner then hid the movie up until the week of release, when it was projected to open to 180 million, but actually opened to 160 million, 20 million less than estimated. How much of that discrepancy is down to critical lambasting, or down to inaccurate projections, is anyone's guess. But that is still a huge opening which should all but guarantee smooth sailing to a billion, unless the movie totally face-planted. Which it did. The second weekend drop was one of the worst in film history, less than 1% away from the epochal drop experienced by Ang Lee's Hulk way back in 2003. And it only went downhill from there. By the time all is said and done, Batman v Superman will struggle to reach even 900 million at the worldwide box office and is unlikely to outgross Deadpool in the US. Reaching the vicinity of 900 million would of course be an impressive feat for almost any other movie, but not so much for Batman v Superman, which Warner fully expected to gross multiple hundreds of million more. Remember, both previous Batman movies crossed the billion dollar threshold and they did not have the added boost of Superman and Wonder Woman, all on screen together for the first time. As a result, several sources such as Birth Movie Steph and others report that there is turmoil within Warner, and considerable tensions between Snyder and Warner executives. Batman v Superman was supposed to get DC on film caught up to where the Marvel Cinematic Universe is now. Instead, they struck out yet again, and still find themselves in the position where they have to win audiences over. Only audience confidence in the DC brand is now arguably lower than it was prior to the release of Batman v Superman. 
They are not giving up. The upside is far too great for that. But the pressure is now on for Suicide Squad and Wonder Woman, let alone for Justice League, which is filming right now in this moment. These movies all have to deliver, none more so than Justice League. Promoting Ben Affleck to executive producer on Justice League to me suggests two things. One, they have confidence in Ben Affleck's ability as a filmmaker and want to give him increased power over the movie. And two, that they don't have the confidence that Zack Snyder will be able to make Justice League the hit Warner desperately needs it to be on his own. Warner is generally filmmaker friendly, but there are limits, and Affleck's recent promotion can certainly be interpreted as an indication that Snyder's stock has depreciated considerably at Warner's. That Batman v Superman, one of their most important movies in recent history underperformed the way it did, is bad enough. On top of that, days before Affleck was appointed executive producer, an interview Snyder gave Entertainment Weekly during the promotion of Watchmen way back in 2008 resurfaced. No one paid much attention to the comments when he made them, as he was directing Watchmen at the time. But now, seven years later, in the aftermath of him actually having directed Batman v Superman, the comments made then make the fans gag now, and probably made Warner executives spit their coffee as well. Snyder told Entertainment Weekly that he didn't like highbrow comics where people weren't killing or having sex with one another, which was what drew him to Watchmen. The implication here is that neither Batman nor Superman comics are up his alley, and the preferences he expresses might go some way towards explaining why both Superman and Batman kills in Snyder's movies, and why Batman likes to freaking brand people with the bat symbol of death. Speaking of Batman, Snyder also was of the opinion that Nolan hadn't gone quite dark enough with Batman in his movies. In Snyder's own words, everyone says that about Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins. Batman's dark. I'm like, okay, no, Batman's cool. He gets to go to a Tibetan monastery and be trained by ninjas, okay? I want to do that. But he doesn't, like, get raped in prison. That could happen in my movie. If you want to talk about dark, that's how that would go. So yeah, Snyder doesn't just want both Batman and Superman to kill people, he also wants to see Batman sodomized in prison, which begs the question, by who? by some random gang leader, by the Joker, because that would certainly add a new level to their relationship. In any event, Zack Snyder seemingly answers to Ben Affleck now, who is a certified card-carrying Batman fan, so Batman's cherry is probably safe for the time being, as Affleck now has veto power. Still, there are many in the fan communities who would have preferred Zack Snyder not directing Justice League at all and who wonder why the movie hasn't been pushed back and placed into the hands of another director. Most likely because that option is not on the table. Warner scheduled a shoot of Justice League to begin just a couple of weeks after Batman v Superman opened, and in so doing, they painted themselves into a corner. They didn't get the detailed audience feedback of where they stepped wrong with Batman v Superman until it had opened, and by then it was too late to plan changes for Justice League and still shoot it on time. They'd have to push the shoot back for that, but by the time they knew they needed to, it was too late. All the actors would have declined other roles to clear their schedule for this. If they did push the shoot back, the actors might have to be compensated, depending on their individual contracts. Also, sets would have been built on highly expensive in-demand sound stages, locations rented, and hotel rooms for the crew booked, catering reserved, and much more. By the time they knew they should probably push the movie back, they had already committed to paying tens of millions in various fees and rentals that would still have to be paid whether the movie shoots now or not. And if they did delay production, they'd have to pay much of that all over again when the movie actually does shoot. In short, they are committed to the shooting schedule, but then that means there isn't time to plan any major adjustments in advance. They'll have to do them on the fly and hope the director is up for the task. They could of course have fired Snyder and had another director step in and take over the movie in the last minute. 
but only the likes of Brett Ratner or McGee or Stephen Summers have the necessary combination of skill and sufficiently low standards that they would step into someone else's troubled major production at such short notice, meaning that Warner is probably better off staying with Snyder anyway. So, they have no real choice but to proceed with Snyder and make it work. Appointing Ben Affleck as executive producer is probably their means to that end. But the turmoil behind the scenes isn't limited to Justice League. On April 29th, The Hollywood Reporter broke the news that the director of the 2018 Flash movie starring Ezra Miller had left the production. According to The Scoop, director Seth Graham Smith left over creative differences, but his script would still be used. I'd like to stress that there doesn't have to be anything dramatic behind this. Seth Graham Smith, the writer of a bunch of zombie fiction, has never directed a movie before, and they have plenty of time to replace him still. It is generally better to lose a director who doesn't see eye to eye with the studio early, than to proceed and have the director and producers all make different movies. Of course, if more directors suddenly start dropping out of DC movies, that is a definite indication that something is rotten behind the scenes at Warner. Case in point, there were rumors that Aquaman director James Wan was considering jumping ship too, but he reassured fans he was staying aboard in a tweet shortly afterwards. Does that mean everything is fine and dandy? Or could that tweet be damage limitation until he has finally made up his mind of what to do? We don't know, but we'll find out soon enough. But the bad news don't end there for DC. Tom Dagnino, aka Schmoville's resident madman Bobby Finstock, tweeted on May 10th, Just got word Suicide Squad is a mess. You heard it here first. This should be taken with a grain of salt, as it isn't backed up by reputable sources with proven track records. It shouldn't be dismissed outright either though. Movies don't get reshoots to the tune of tens of millions unless there is a damn good reason for it. If we, for the sake of argument, assume this is correct, it is still important to stress that the movie is still being edited. The reshoots are not yet fully incorporated into the movie. Even if the current cut of the movie indeed is a mess, that doesn't mean the final cut necessarily will be, or so we can hope at least. It will be interesting to see how the happenings behind the scenes of the DC Expanded Universe continue to progress from here on out, which we'll keep you up to date with here at Midnight's Edge. If you like this video, please hit that subscribe button. Join us for spin-free news and analysis of the happenings and corporate politics behind the scenes of your favorite genre movies, as well as explorations of your favorite characters and their backgrounds and context here at Midnight's Edge.